today, Lord, and all that's said and done here. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. I thank you as we sang about Calvary and the other hymns. I thank you for those encouraging hymns, Lord, for uh, just the pick-me-ups that they are to us and the help that we get spiritually from singing those. And, and Lord, just uh, all that those hymn writers gave to us. Thank you for every one of them, Lord. I pray that you bless uh, thy people this morning, be with the Sunday school kids and the teacher. Uh, let everything go smoothly and well over there. And again, just thank you that we can gather again today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
to the point where they just didn't want to do these dives anymore. Now, today I'm going to talk about not so much the entrance, but I'm going to talk about the pit itself. Now, of course, every one of these things that I'll mention with Jacques Cousteau and this other one I'm going to mention, of course, everyone says it's been proven that's a hoax. I mentioned last week, but I didn't use this word in the Finnish newspaper. Mike's been, he'll enjoy Finnish newspaper written back in October of 2013. There's a word used, and I don't know what this word means, but it's amen nusatia. A M M E N N U S A T I A. Amen nusatia. That's well, I will pronounce it, I guess. I don't know if that's right or not. But this deals with the story of the Russians drilling over in Siberia. And they drilled 14.4 kilometers down. And when they got down to that point, something broke free with their drill. And they realized that they had drilled through the Earth's crust. And as they pulled that back up, they had this hole that they had drilled 14.4 kilometers down. And of course, they say that they were doing this because at the time, America and Russia were in the Cold War. And this happened back in the 80s in the Cold War. And everybody was looking for an advantage over each other. So they decided to drill way down. And they hit this plug, this hole. And what they did was they lowered a microphone down in there. And when they lowered the microphone down in, they too heard screams and they could recognize human screams. Now, the scientists were so scared at what they heard and so freaked out by it that half of them quit the, quit the, the whole um, experiment or whatever they were doing and left. And weird things begin to happen after they heard this to these scientists and to this group of men. They drilled down in there in Siberia and of course, this was dismissed as a hoax because the thought was, how could a microphone endure 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit? It would have melted at the very just presence of all that heat. But, you know, they, how did the drill head endure that kind of heat? You know, you have to ask yourself many questions. But what did they hear? Did they hear human screams? Now, though it's been dismissed as a hoax and... Jacques Cousteau, the same thing and all, it's a hoax. And that's just the world's way of saying, see, these things don't exist. But what I have here is not a hoax. And whether you believe the first one or not, which it could be very plausible that you could hear those things. As I said last week about the door that they found at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, you know, there has to be an entrance. And from the scripture, there are many entrances. And I'm going to go over those entrances and some of the supernatural things that exist around those entrances. Okay, so this will be a part two. For those that enjoyed part one, I decided to do this again for you. Um, and again, especially some of you young men who listen to it, maybe this will stir up your minds to maybe one day preach the gospel to people that are going to the pit and to try to get people saved. Uh, let's go to Amos chapter nine. I didn't use this verse last week, but this is actually the verse that I had as a text verse. And for some reason, I just avoided it last week. Amos chapter 9 and verse number 2. We'll look at 2 and 3. Now, isn't it weird that the Lord says you can do this? Amos 9 verse 2. And this goes right hand in hand with what the Russians tried to do. What's it say in verse 2? Amos 9, verse 2. And I'll wait for you to get there because it's a very important verse. I know Amos is a tough book to find. Amos 9, verse 2. Though they do what? Dig. What were the Russians doing? They were drilling, which is essentially the same as digging. Though they dig into hell. Does the Lord say it's possible? So where is hell? Where did God establish? Where do you get it from here? Hell would have to be in the middle of the earth. You could dig into it. It would have to be somewhere down. 
Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. So you can see that heaven is up and hell is down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. Now look at this. Though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea. What did we talk about last week? Bottom of the sea. Thence will I command the serpent. and He shall bite them. There's a serpent associated with the bottom of the sea. You can see that here. Verse number three. Okay, now let's get into the pit. Without further delay, let's look at some of these things. Now, I'm going to go first off to Genesis, and I'm going to go to a type of Christ. And I'm going to show you that when Christ was on the cross, what did he scream? What did he yell? There were seven sayings that Christ did on the cross. Seven sayings. Okay. As he hung on the cross. And one notably that he said was, I thirst. Now, what some theologians say and what the scripture seems to indicate, and I believe this to be true, that when he was on the cross, he suffered hell for every person who ever lived. Now, he was thirsting. And that's the one thing that in the hell we can see from the rich man. What did he crave? He craved water. Now, I have watched a death process occur in many, many people. And there's something that happens when people begin to die, when they die. And it happens to the body, and this happens with age as well. The reason we age, and I can't prove all this, but it sure seems to be a unique thing. We dry up. We just can't hold moisture anymore. You know, in the Bible, the Bible talks about young people and their bones being full of what? Full of milk. Full of milk. Young people's flesh, their, their flesh shall be fresher than a child. What's the goal of people who try to keep their skin in, in, in good shape? They always try to keep it what? Moisturized. Moisturized. And it almost seems like your joints need moisture. And as you age, those things begin to dry up. And as people die, they get thirsty, very thirsty. And I have seen people die where they just want water. It's what happens with death. If you were to eternally die, God would let you suffer thirst forever and ever and ever. So we can get a taste of what eternal death would be in the fact that we are drying up. Imagine being so dry, so, so dry, that all you wanted was a drop of water on your tongue. Nobody can experience that kind of dryness on earth. But in hell, that's all he wanted was a drop of water. So if Joseph is a type of Christ, Christ would have gone to the pit in some way, whether he was on the cross, and he would have experienced massive thirst, which is why he cries out and he says, I thirst. And they gave him what? They gave him vinegar. And when it touched, he wouldn't take of it. He was thirsty. He was thirsty for water. Okay. Something was happening with him. He was feeling hell and eternal death for every one of us. And the extent of that has to be unbelievable, humongous, massive, gigantic. The extent of what he suffered on the cross for us with the thirst that he had alone. Now, you're going to notice one thing. Joseph was also thrown into a pit, wasn't he? But there's something unique about the Bible. It tells us the pit was what? What did that rich man want? Water. And if Joseph is a type of Christ, Christ suffered hell for every man. Joseph was thrown into a pit that had no water. Isn't that weird? God makes sure, he says, and there was no water in the pit. Joseph 30, or not Joseph, chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And let's look in 
verse 24. Genesis 37, verse 24. And they took him, cast him into a pit. Now, it could it could just end with a period there, but it doesn't. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Okay? Joseph is a perfect type of Jesus. He was cast into a pit, and there was no water in it. Now, let me ask this. God has gates and bars. And if we would think about this, as we did last week, there must be entrances to the pit on earth. And of course, God knows where they are. The question comes, since God's in control of his creation, can God make his own entrance? And did he? Did he? If you've ever read the sermon, Sinners in the Hand of a angry God, you understand that in there that Jonathan Edwards, as he spoke the sermon, like I'm talking now, he didn't get worked up. He didn't scream. He didn't holler. People were falling on the floor of the church, holding onto the pillars, hoping that God would not open up the floor of the church and that they wouldn't fall directly into the pit. That's how convicted they were when the sermon was preached. Did that happen in the scripture? Turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. God opened up the earth. He created his own door. And we know the pit to be down and in the earth, regardless of what scientists believe, and however they can determine that these things are hoaxes, natural occurring things, the scripture tells us where the pit is. So regardless of what they believe, God says it's there. And God can open up the mouth of the pit at any time he wants to. And it says in verse chapter 16 and verse 28, And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own, own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit. So where's the pit? It's down. And the only thing separating us from the pit is the earth that we stand on. And God could, if he wanted to, open up the mouth of the earth, and everyone on the earth could fall down into the pit as it happened here. God could do that. 31, and he did it. It says, and it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. Okay, now imagine. Here they are standing, and, God, and Moses says, that God's going to do a new thing. If these men die, the common death. And all of a sudden, the earth began to rattle, and things begin to move. And all of a sudden, the instability under their feet and the earth begin to open up. Now, think about this. Do we have openings in the earth that are caused by plates moving back and forth? Is there one in the U.S.? What's it called? The San Andreas Fault. And some say that there's going to be a great earthquake one day and the earth is going to shift and all of California... And all those liberal, no, no, <laughs> I'll be good. And it's going to shift and it's going to move and it's going to fall where? Into the sea. Now, these are fault lines in the earth. God's in control of moving the plates, isn't he? So there must be ways that God can open it up and it opens its mouth. And here it shifted. 
and the people want it, boy, imagine how they felt. And everything they had, they and everything that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. So when thinking about the pit, the pit is below our feet. Hell would be below our feet. Hell is a place of no water. Hell and the pit, if we say the pit or hell, vice versa, whatever we want to interchange those words, has gates and bars. And these gates, as I preached last week, it looks as if can be seen with the human eye, if you could find them. Okay, let's go a little further with this. Let's go to Job. Job chapter 17. Job 17. Now, if you'd fall down into the pit, what would you become? If it has gates and bars, you would become a prisoner, wouldn't you? You'd become a prisoner. Job chapter 17. Job 17. And let's look in verse 16. It says, Job 17, verse 16. They shall go down to the bars of the pit when our rest together is in the dust. Now, when King David spoke in the book of Psalms, he talked about the wicked descending down into the pit. So when you think about this at death, someone who isn't saved will have no spirit in them to take them up. See, what's going to take us up to heaven is the spirit of God is one with our spirit because we got saved. When you got saved, the spirit of God came into you and the spirit of God quickened you and he became one with you and we're married to Christ. And when we die, it's the spirit of God in us that's married to our spirit and that spirit is going to take us up. But an unsaved person has no spirit of God in them to take them up. The Bible says that they'll descend. So this is all the higher. You could say, well, somebody can get in a plane and they can go 60, 70,000 feet up. Yeah, that's all the higher they'll ever go. An unsaved person will never go up where we're going. Praise the Lord. You're saved today. You're going to heaven. This preaching today shouldn't scare you at all. It should, it should compel you to want to witness to people so that they can be spared from an eternity in this place. Because when somebody dies, it's too late. And I always say this, with salvation, when there's breath, there's still hope. I don't care if they are about to take their last breath. If a person is on their deathbed and can barely breathe, where there is breath, there is still hope. And that person in their dying breath, in their last breath, the last one, Jesus, save me. Where do they go? In their dying breath, they've escaped the gates of hell. They've escaped the bars of hell. They've escaped the pit. And I'll tell you this. If, they, if a person does not repent, by the time they take their very last breath, they will become a prisoner. A prisoner forever and ever and ever. Yesterday when we went preaching, Phil sent out a text and he said, I'm coming down, I'm going to pick up donuts. Who wants a donut? So he waited and he said, Sent me, he said, Pastor, I didn't hear from anybody. I don't know if anybody's coming. I said, You want a donut? I said, Sure, I'll take a donut. And I said, Can you give me a coffee with that too? And you know, <laughs> I put my order in and Phil come down in the corner and I said, I wanted a maple cake donut from DeAngelis with the Jimmy's on top and a chocolate icing. That's perfect. I'll take it. So he said, I, I don't know why, but I bought an extra donut. He says, I was thinking because I want an extra donut. I bought an extra donut, so I'm going to eat two donuts. And I said, no, you're only eating one donut. I said, you got an extra donut? He said, yeah. He said, and I said, on the text, Donnie said, bring me a donut. <coughs> Donnie was on duty. And he said, laugh out loud. So I said, we're going to take Donnie a donut. 
So we got done preaching, me, Tommy, and Phil. Tommy said, I don't want the donut. Okay, we're taking it down to Donnie. So we called Donnie on our way to Alan Corpus. He said, what are you guys doing? You can't go. I said, we're on our way. Where are you? He said, just come to the station. So he said, call me when you get. So we got to the station and called him. He come walking out, big smile on his face. We got him a donut. We walked in and I said, hey, while I'm here, can I have the tour? And he said, sure. So he took me around. And to think about this, prisoners go behind what? Bars. And I said, you know, I was curious, where do you keep everybody? And he said, right in there. So I walked in and I said, man, look at this. I said, it's just a steel toilet with a little sink. And there's the bed where they lay. And it kind of got chains that holds it down, kind of like what you'd see on TV, but creepy. And he said, you want me to pull the gate shut? <laughs> you want me to pull the bar shut? He said, "Get the, you can get the full feeling. I said, no, no, no. It feels like, no, that's okay. I'm good. So we were in there and I thought, man, if I get on the other side of the law and I disobey the law, I'm going to find myself behind the gates and all like, and, and I think it was Phil or Tommy, they said, I wonder if it sounds like clang. And I said, I don't know, but boy, to be on the other side, you are a prisoner. And you are held in by bars. You know, when you think about this, that whole idea of things on earth being like things in heaven. And we talk about the tabernacle on earth being a pattern of things in heaven. And even the homes we live in being a pattern of things in the homes in heaven. And our bodies being a pattern of what's in heaven and a pattern of how God is. Look at that picture right there. For those that are on Zoom, you're not going to see this. But we have a picture of a man in hell. Look at that picture right there. That man there is on fire. That man there is burning. That man there is in a place where he can't get out of. And if he ever could get to the bars and to the gates, he could pull on it all day long, but you can't get out because God has sealed him in. He is a prisoner. And he's not necessarily a prisoner of God. Who is he a prisoner of? He's a prisoner of a ruthless, ruthless, ruthless warden who has no compassion and has no pity. Prisoners. Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah 24. And if anyone is listening to this today and doesn't know the Lord is their Savior, I beg you, get to Calvary as quick as you can. And repent of your sins and trust Christ as soon and as you can. Run to the cross. Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, verse 22. It says in verse 22, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered where? In the pit. And shall be shut up in the prison. All right, prisoners gathered in the pit and shut up in the prison. I had my opportunity to be shut up yesterday. I don't ever want to be shut up in a prison. The only way I ever want to be shut behind uh, prison bars is when I'm visiting a prisoner with my Bible as a pastor, as a free man, knowing I'm getting back out. That's the only way I want to go behind bars. Um, and praise God, if you keep the law, you uphold the law, you'll be spared from that. Unless you, of course, are sent in as an innocent person, which sometimes that happens. And praise, pray to God, it may never, it will never happen with us. So who's in charge of the prison? All right. I'm glad you asked. Who is the warden? Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Isaiah. Let's 
Let's go to Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel chapter 28, and then Isaiah. And we'll, we'll go to Ezekiel first. Ezekiel 28. 28 verse 1. We'll read from 1 down through verse 8. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God, a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Now, you should have a cross-reference here in your Bible to 2 Thessalonians. Do you have that? Anybody have that 2 Thessalonians cross-reference? You should have that, because this is Antichrist. Antichrist is going to step up, and he's going to say that he's a God. And we've looked at that so many times in 2 Thessalonians, I don't have time to go there. But trust me, you can read it later. He's going to set his heart as God, as the heart of God. Verse 3, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom, with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver in thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thou saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit. Thou shalt die the death of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. So Antichrist is going to be brought down to the sides of the pit, okay? That will be his eternal abode. And we know that occurs because the Bible says that they're cast into the bottomless pit there in Revelation. Also in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah 14. And let's look in verse number 12. And here the pit is mentioned again. Isaiah chapter 14. And I'm going to read to you. Isaiah chapter 14, and I'm going to read this to you while you're there. I'm going to read here. Okay, just listen. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Where does the devil live? Satan lives in the earth. Okay? And he has a throne there. Now it says in Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah 14, and let's look there in verse 22, or Isaiah 14, 12, I'm sorry, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. To what? The sides of the pit. The sides of the pit. Okay. Now I want you to turn over to Jonah. Turn over to Jonah. Let's turn over to Jonah. And let's look in chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. Let's look in chapter 1, verse 17. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now what did I say the earth, the whale was like? I already gave it away. The whale is a type of the earth. So it has a mouth. And we saw the mouth of the earth. God opened up the mouth and it swallowed people down into the pit. So here's the idea. The same way it occurred in numbers. Imagine a great whale inside the earth. Because the whale's a type of the earth. Imagine its mouth being right underneath where those people stood. And all of a sudden God says to the earth like a whale, open your mouth. And the earth opens her mouth like a huge whale. And what happens? Just like Jonah, these people have nothing to stand on. And what happens? They go down through the mouth. 
and they go down the throat and they go down the whale's esophagus and they line right up in the belly of the whale, which is in the pit, the heart of the earth. That's what happened to Jonah. That's what happened to those that were in the pit. Okay, so you can envision this. The inside of the earth being like the belly of the whale. What does Jesus say? As Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights where? In the heart of the earth, in that belly of the whale, the heart of the earth. Now, we know when Christ was there, he preached. He didn't suffer when he was there. He preached, and he took captivity captive. And the reason I point over here is because paradise. Paradise was there. Christ took it and brought it up to heaven. And that gets into a whole different teaching altogether. But let's go to Jonah. It says three days and three nights. Verse two. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now, I got into this theological debate about this. Did Jonah die? when he was in the belly of the whale. And after we studied this out, studied it out, and I think you did a study on this as well, the determination was, yes, Jonah died, and God let him experience hell. And that's why he says here in verse 2, out of the belly of hell cried I. So it looks like he died. And God let him go to hell and brought him back from hell. It says in verse 3, For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All the billows and thy waves, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountain. Okay? What's under the bottoms of the mountain? Were the Russians up to something? And did they find something that God let them hear at the bottom of the mountains, at the bottom of the earth? The earth's crust is like 22 miles thick, but in some areas it's thinner than others. 14.4 kilometers, they got down into a hollow space and they heard screaming. Bottoms of the mountains. And the earth with her bars is about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercies. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Love this. Five words. Salvation is of the Lord. Aren't you glad you were saved? Jonah got a taste of hell. And the Lord spake unto the fish. It had his, if he was dead, it had his dead body. And the Lord was able to bring life back into that body and bring his soul back up. And the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And then God told him, go to Nineveh again. What did he say? Yes. I'll do it this time. God dealt with him. And doesn't God deal with us many times about things? Okay, now, in closing this, there was a man by the name of Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot did what? He betrayed the Lord. And he hanged himself. And when he hanged himself, the Bible says that in another passage, his bowels gushed out. And it's apparent that when he hanged himself, the tree limb was weak and gave way after his dead body was up there for a little while. And he got bloated while he was hanging because nobody took him down for a couple of days, probably. And as I said in Sunday school, those chemical reactions and stuff begin to take place. And he bloated and his body fell down the cliff and landed on the rocks below. And the Bible says that his bowels gushed out. Where did he go? Where did he go? 
Well, you say he died. Yes, but the Bible says that he went to his place in a place prepared. Don't we have a place prepared? Didn't Christ say he'd come again and receive us to himself? That where I am, there you may be. God. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. Judas had a place prepared for him. How many letters are in the name Judas Iscariot? How many letters? There are 13. There are 13 in that name. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, it talks about the son of perdition. It talks about the mystery of iniquity. It talks about the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There was a spirit to Judas Iscariot. And there's something to his spirit. He went to his place. God prepared a place for him. He was, the Bible says, have not I chosen 12 of, 12 of you, and one of you is what? A, a devil. Judas Iscariot was a devil. You know what his real name is? You know what his real name is? You can give me one of two names. What's his real name? His name is Abaddon, or his name is Apollyon. Spirit of Judas Iscariot rules over the pit. And there's a king that rules over the pit. And the spirit of Judas Iscariot is going to release something. And they're going to come up out of the door to the bottomless pit. I didn't get to go here last year or last week. I only mentioned. But I want you to go to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. And I'm going to put the icing on the cake with this message. I'm going to read some of chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. I'll tell you, if you're not saved, this should scare the bejeebies out of you. It should make you, and I, I'm not a fear monger in trying to get people saved, but I'll tell you this, if you're not saved, you should fear. You should fear. Because your eternal soul lies at the point. You're one breath away from the pit. You are one breath away from the pit. I tell you, when I see people on the road I'm driving because I do a lot of driving for work and I see motorcycles coming by me at 100 mile an hour sometimes. I mean, and they are just flying and they're just weaving in and out of traffic. I think to myself, if you are not saved, how close one pebble, one pebble, that wheel could slide on one pebble and you would be instantly in the pit instantly how quick is death have you ever read about the odd ways people die and some of the crazy crazy ways people die there was something on tv i never really got to watch it just maybe tune in five minutes or something Ten thousand different ways to die who's ever I, did anybody ever watch that and some of them, like I was watching just a couple, I said, who would have expected that? You're going for a run on the beach. And an airplane runs you over. Who would think that? I'm going to get up this morning and I'm going to eat my breakfast and I'm going to go for a jog on the beach. Who would ever think that would be the last breath you'd ever take? The last run you'd ever do. You'd say, well, maybe the sand would sink down into the sand. But who would guess an airplane would run them over? My point is, if you're not saved, death is sure. And sometimes death is so quick. And so unexpected. And so bizarre. And a person leaves this planet alive one second, dead the next. 
Where am I? For the rest of eternity. If you're not saved, seal your eternal destiny. Come to Christ Jesus. I know you died for me. Save me. I'm a sinner. Need to be saved. Save me. How easy is that? Revelation 9. Revelation 9. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him. I didn't know stars were guys. What kind of star is this? It's an angel. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Somewhere, someplace, there's a door. And again, we tried to look at possibly where it was last week. But he's got a key, and there's a door. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. So from verse six, I take it that they're, they're going to be just like zombies. And the fetish with zombies on the earth right now, day of dead, dawn of the dead, night of the living dead, this uh, zombie flick, that zombie flick, every other zombie thing that's, it, people are obsessed with it. God's going to say your obsession is going to come true. For five months, people aren't going to die. Death is going to flee from them. That's what it says. Verse 7, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. Now, I've been asked this question, Pastor, are they big or are they small? When I was younger, I used to think they were like dinosaur type big creatures, maybe because I wanted them to be big. But as I got older, I thought to myself, no, these are like locusts. Locusts are big bugs, so they're probably five, six inches maybe. But the appearance of them, it says, like on the horses prepared on the battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of of chariots of many horses running to battle. They had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And the reason God's going to take death away from five months for five months is, is so they feel the pain of these stings. And they're going to desire to die. They're going to be that bad. So death for five months. Verse 11, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And I believe Abaddon or Apollyon lived in Judas Iscariot. I believe that that was the spirit that was behind him. And he went to his place and that Judas Iscariot is the king over the bottomless pit. Now, we go on a little further. And it says in verse number 12, one woe is past. Behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded and heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day 
and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army, the horsemen, were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. Now, as heaven has horses, and we come back on white horses, I believe that hell has horses, and hell has horsemen. And I believe that they're going to be unleashed, and they too will come up out of, out of the bottomless pit like the locust did. In verse 17, because he sees it in the same chapter. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and then that, them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jasith and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Remember in Amos? What was in the bottom of the sea? God said it chased them with. It chased them with serpents. Isn't it weird that the horse's tails are serpents? It says in verse 20, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. Now I tell you what, you want to be spared? What did God say you need to do? You need to repent. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And it comes right down to it. It's repent or perish. You want to go to heaven when you die? You've got to repent of your sins. And did God use this message today to bring someone to the foot of the cross? To say, Lord, I'm afraid of my eternal destiny. I don't want to go to hell, Lord. I am so afraid of what Pastor Kevin said today. If all of that is true, if there is a pit like that and it's fiery and it has gates, I don't want to go there. Lord, I want you to save me. I want you to save me in the worst way. I want to be spared. If that's you today, whether you're listening to Zoom, whether you're here, or whether you're listening to this in the future, if you're listening to this message today, you say, I want to do that, Pastor Kevin. I want to repent. I want so bad to be saved. I know Christ can save me. I believe he died for me. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose again from the day, a dead. I believe that he can save me. Will you pray with me and mean it from your heart and ask Jesus to come into your heart and be your personal savior? Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're listening today and you want to pray this prayer, this is what you need to pray. Something like this. Pray with me. Mean it from your heart. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Lord, I now repent of my sins. Forgive me. Take your precious blood and wash me. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be my personal Savior. Save my soul from hell. Take me to heaven when I die. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for saving me. In your precious name I pray. Amen. And if you meant it, you truly got saved. The scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You will no longer, you are no longer ever going to be a prisoner of the devil. He will never be your warden. Thank God. Our commander and our savior is where we're going to see in heaven someday to walk on streets of gold because you accepted Christ as your savior. Praise the Lord. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we go, I pray that you'd help us, Lord. Give us a renewed zeal to witness. Help us, Lord, to remember this sermon today, that we would use it not only for our own benefit in serving you, but, Lord, that we'd take it to the lost and tell them of the pit, tell them of hell, tell them of eternal damnation, and try to win them, Lord. I pray that you'd help us, Lord. Go before us and guide the way. Lord, 
please prepare the hearts. In a world we live where people just don't want to hear it anymore, Lord, open up the hearts, soften people, Lord, even in these last days. Well, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.